May we pray. Heavenly Father, please speak to each one of us this morning through your living word. Amen. Well, I have to say I'm quite excited about starting a new series today. We're starting looking at the letter of James. And when Rob, Jane, Rebecca and I were studying James together, we got a lot from it. It's a great book. It's great for studying on your own, great to study with a group, and hopefully great to have a series of sermons on. On the notice sheet I've put details of a couple of commentaries and also uh, a, a YouTube clip that I think might be helpful in giving you uh, more background. So if you want to find out more then you know where to go. But why is James such a good book? Well, it's so full of practical wisdom. It covers everyday issues. How we should speak to one another. How we should think about money. How to approach conflict. How to deal with sickness and suffering. It's wonderfully down to earth. And there's a lot in this first eight verses, more than I'll be able to cover in detail. But before we get cracking, I want to just say something about the structure of the book. Most of the letter is going to focus on, focus on our relationships with one another. Indeed, from chapter 1, verse 26 onwards, that's what James will be talking about, how we, how we deal with one another. But he starts off by checking our individual relationship with God. If you want to show genuine care to those around you, then first of all, you have to make sure that you are nurturing your relationship with God. And this is true whether your desire is to be a good parent, a good worker, a good friend, a good Sunday club leader, a good vicar. Make sure your relationship with God comes first. And so before dealing with all these topics about how we should get on with one another, James gives us advice on key aspects of our relationship with God. He'll be asking questions like, are you and I really moving on to maturity in our faith? Are we holding fast through times of trial? Are we seeking God's wisdom? Are we humble? Are we taking God's word seriously? Well, enough of background, let's begin. James, that's how the letter begins. And there was only one James living who could just write his name like that and everyone would know who he was. It was James, the brother of Jesus, who was leader of the church in Jerusalem. And he's writing to Christians everywhere. It may be confusing to us to be called the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, but that is the name he gives to the Christians. The reason for calling us the 12 tribes is that the Christian church is the new Israel. There were 12 tribes in the old Israel and he describes Christians as the 12 tribes. We are the people of God. And, the and after the introduction, verse 2 of the letter begins with what seems like a really bizarre statement. And there will be some of you that will find it very difficult to hear this. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. It reminded me of a story I read about Chippy the parakeet. Chippy didn't see it coming. One second he was peacefully perched in his cage the next, he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. The problem began when Chippy's owner decided to clean his cage with the vacuum cleaner. She removed the attachment from the end of the hose, stuck it in the cage. The phone rang. She turned to answer it. She'd barely said hello when the parakeet was sucked into the cleaner. On opening the cleaner, she found her pet alive, but stunned, and covered in dust. She grabbed him, ran to the bathroom, and under running water began to clean him. 
Realizing he was shocked, and by now shivering under the cold water, she did what any compassionate bird owner might do. She reached for the hairdryer and blasted the poor bird with hot air. Chippy didn't know what hit him. A few days after the trauma, the news reporter who'd initially written about the event contacted the owner to ask how the bird was recovering. Well, she replied, Chippy doesn't sing anymore. He just sits there and stares. <laughs> and all James wants to say to Chippy is, consider it pure joy. <laughs> Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance and perseverance leads to maturity and completeness. This is really important. James is saying trials are coming your way. They may already be with you at the moment. It may be sickness or bereavement or financial loss or loneliness or breakdown in relationships or pressures at work or whatever. And James is not saying if they come or maybe such things are coming your way. Being a Christian does not mean we carry around a get-out-of-trials-free card. We do not. If you think you've signed up for an easy passage through life, I'm sorry, you've got it wrong. And you and I need to wake up to the fact that bad things are going to happen to us. It is part of life and we shouldn't be surprised by it. And if we are surprised by it, we've almost lost the battle before we started. C.S. Lewis writes this. Imagine a set of people all living in the same building. Half of them think it's a hotel. The other half think it's a prison. Those who think it's a hotel might regard it as quite intolerable and really, really rather appalling. Those who thought it was a prison might decide that it was rather surprisingly comfortable and there were some good things about it. Too many of us expect life to be far too easy. These comments were handed into the visitor's centre in a wilderness area in America. Too many bugs and leeches and spiders and spider webs. Please spray the wilderness to rid the area of these pests. There are too many rocks in the mountains. The coyotes made too much noise last night and kept me awake. Please eradicate these annoying animals. Escalators would help on the uphill sections. A McDonald's would help at the trailhead. <laughs> So let's first of all be realistic about what we expect life to bring us. As I think Mark Twain said, life is one darn thing after another. The second thing is that when expected trials, when they come, James is not saying we should react with, oh praise the Lord, I've been sucked up by the vacuum cleaner, or I've crashed the car, praise the Lord. Occasionally you do meet Christians who think that's what they're expected to do. But it doesn't honour God when we praise him for horrible or evil things. Jesus didn't pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, Oh Lord, I'm so grateful that I'm going to be flogged. Happy days. Or I'm going to be nailed to the cross. Oh joy, bring it on Lord. James is not saying we need to pretend that this is fun. He doesn't want so much to change how we feel about trials, he wants to change how we think about them. James wants us to take a long-term view and say, this trial will be an opportunity for my faith to grow towards maturity. And we need faith to grow through struggles. This world, we'd be, like it to be designed for pleasure, but actually it's designed for character. I found this story helpful. 
a boy found a cocoon in his garden and took it to his mother. And together they put it in a jar and his mother took the opportunity to explain how it had been a caterpillar. And now it had changed into a cocoon and one day it would become a butterfly. And the boy watched every day, waiting for the butterfly to emerge. And one day it happened, a small hole appeared in the cocoon. And the butterfly started to struggle to come out. At first the boy was excited, but soon he became concerned. The butterfly was having to struggle so hard to get out. It looked like it couldn't break free. It looked desperate. It looked like it was making no progress. The boy was so concerned he decided to help. He got some scissors and snipped the cocoon to make the hole bigger and the butterfly quickly emerged. As the butterfly came out the boy was surprised. It had a swollen body and small shriveled wings. He continued to watch the butterfly expecting that at any moment the wings would dry out, enlarge and expand to support the swollen body. He knew that in time the body would shrink and the butterfly's wings would expand. But neither happened. The butterfly spent the rest of its life crawling around with a swollen body and shriveled wings. It never was able to fly. Without the struggle getting free from the cocoon, the butterfly would never ever fly. The struggle was vital for the butterfly to grow to maturity. Hudson Taylor was a great missionary to China. His story is an incredible read. His wife became blind towards the end of her life. And someone asked her, why should you suffer after all the years of serving, doing things for God and for others? Why should this happen to you? And she replied, I suppose God wants to put the finishing touches to my character. I find such a way of thinking very challenging. Sadly, sadly, you and I, most of the time, we're not really bothered that much about maturity or completeness or character. Instead, we pursue comfort and the easy life. We'd rather be left alone. We can't be done with the hassles of changing. Oh, it might be nice if we were a little more generous, a little more loving, a little less angry, but nothing too much, please. But one thing about this letter is that James will not allow complacency. He will constantly challenge us. He's not interested in producing third-rate Christians who are hoping that God is so merciful that they will scrape into heaven and that they will thoroughly enjoy it there, even though they've done so little to experience the life of heaven here on earth. James wants you and me to be serious about Christian growth. He's saying to us here, trials are not for nothing. They shouldn't be wasted experiences because God's wanting to achieve something through them as we persevere through them. Trials will tend to consume us. We all know that it's hard when you're going through them to think about anything else. It's hard to look through the pain. There is no automatic benefit from going through trials. And I'm sure you all know of people for whom a severe trial has led to them uh, either their faith being very much weakened or perhaps even them losing their faith. Perhaps that's an experience that's happened to you in your life. There is nothing automatic about it. That's why James counsels us, consider it joy. How you think about things is vital. If I see my trials as a sign that God doesn't love me, that he's not listening to my prayers, that this world is, is just a chaotic mess and that God's not almighty, if I see it that way, then my faith will suffer. My relationship with God will suffer. But if instead through my trials I cling to him while the storms are going on around me, if I know 
that God will be at work, then at the end of it, my faith will have grown. Your faith will grow through trials if you look to God. You and I need to fight to force our perspective and vision above and beyond the present suffering and look forward to the good that God will produce in time. The joy of being more like Jesus or in our reading as James describes it in verse 4 as being mature and complete not lacking in anything. But that description, mature and complete, not lacking in anything, is not where you and I are at at the moment. James knows we need help. And so in verse 5, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, and basically he's saying, if any of you lacks wisdom, and you all do, ask for wisdom. Wisdom because we need to help to see life, life's trials in a different way. We need wisdom to know what to do in the situation, what choices we should make. I love these words from King David who went through such a lot in his life, so many trials. In Psalm 25 he says, show me your ways Lord, teach me your paths, guide me in your truth, teach me. What a brilliant prayer. We need wisdom. When trials come, this is not a time when God says to us, well, it's time for you to step up. It's time for you to, to, to go through this trial to prove yourself. Man up. Show what you're made of. Instead, James says, it's time to ask God for help. And you will know amongst your friends that there are some of them who, when they're going through rough patches, when they're going through trials, they will keep it hidden. They will fight and fight not to ask for help, not to even let it be known. And the same is true of you and me when we relate to God. Too many of us will feel, oh this is something I've got to battle through on my own. I'll be letting myself down or I'll be denying my faith if I cried out for help. But you and I are made to need God's help. We need help and there's great news in this passage. Take a look at verse 5. It reminds us first of all that God gives generously. God is not tight-fisted. He is super generous. He's not going to say, I've run out of generosity. I've used up my quota for this month. Try again another time. God is super generous. Secondly, it says God gives to all. God's help isn't restricted to bishops or vicars and perhaps maybe for curates and interns. It's not restricted to platinum card Christians. It's for all of us. And thirdly, it says that God's generosity is without finding fault. God's not going to say to you, well you really messed up this time. Uh, you've brought this on yourself. He's not going to say, oh, surely by now you know how to cope with this. Perhaps James was thinking of his big brother, Jesus' words. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now I know that some of you will read the next words in verse 6. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt. You'll, you'll read that as the small print and you'll think, oh, I knew there'd be a catch in this, some reason why I wouldn't get what I asked for. But what James is referring to is not it's not about never having questions or never having doubts. It's not about whipping ourselves up into some state of absolute belief. What James explains is that he's talking about double-minded people. Someone who's constantly flitting between what God wants and what worldly wisdom says. Someone who's thinking, well I know God wants me to do this, but perhaps I can find a better offer from somebody else. Or I can find an easier way of doing this. James is saying, if you want, 
God to give you wisdom, you must really want it. It was Saint Augustine who recorded that he used to pray, Lord make me pure, but not yet. Such prayers show that we're not really serious. And James is asking, look, if you're going to pray for wisdom, be serious. Do you want to grow in your Christian life? But perhaps some of you are thinking, but Stephen, it's, it, it's really not that simple. God didn't answer my prayer. And it's true that after you've prayed, you may not receive a sudden flash of inspiration, an ah moment where you suddenly know what to do and all becomes clear. You may be tempted to think, oh, I must have failed in, in one of the conditions. I didn't have enough faith. And you start to beat yourself up. You know, Christians are very good at beating themselves up. God doesn't like it. That's what Satan loves when we beat ourselves up. God wants to encourage us and help us. James assures us wisdom will be given. We may not feel any more confident but God will be at work. He will be protecting you from folly. He will be at work guiding you in the right pathway. We may not see the whole of the journey, but he will help you through the next step. So may we bow our heads in prayer. Lord, show me your ways. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth. Teach me. And help us to rejoice in the good that you can bring through our trials. Amen. And we're going to uh, sing a song.